This is Space Time, Series 21, Episode 83, for broadcast on the 19th of October, 2018. Coming up on Space Time, a new hypothesis showing how ancient Mars could have had life, China ready to explore the lunar far side, and what happens when a white dwarf and brown dwarf collide. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A new study has found strong evidence that ancient Mars had the right ingredients for microbial life. The findings, reported in the journal Earth and Planetary Science Letters, suggest the red planet had an ample supply of chemical energy for microbes to thrive underground. The study's lead author, Jesse Tarnas from Brown University, says the research shows that, based on basic physics and chemistry calculations, the ancient Martian subsurface likely had enough dissolved hydrogen to power a global subsurface biosphere. The study concludes that the conditions in this subterranean habitable zone would have been similar to places on Earth where underground life exists today. Earth is home to what's known as subsurface lithotropic microbial ecosystems. Lacking energy from sunlight, these subterranean microbes often get their energy by peeling electrons off molecules in their surrounding environments. Dissolved molecular hydrogen is a great electron donor and is known to fuel subsurface lithotropic microbial ecosystems on Earth. This new study shows that radiolysis, a process through which radiation breaks water molecules into their constituent hydrogen and oxygen parts, would have created plenty of hydrogen in the ancient Martian subsurface. Researchers estimate that hydrogen concentrations in the red planet's crust 4 billion years ago would have been within a range of concentrations capable of sustaining microbial life on Earth today. Of course, these findings don't mean that life definitely existed on ancient Mars. But they do suggest that if life did indeed get started, the Martian subsurface had the key ingredients to support it for hundreds of millions of years. The work also has implications for future Mars exploration, suggesting that areas where the ancient subsurface is exposed might be good places to look for evidence of past life. Ever since the discovery decades ago of ancient river channels and lake beds on Mars, scientists have been tantalised by the possibility that the red planet may also once have hosted life. But while the evidence of past water activity on Mars is unmistakable, it's not clear for how much of Martian history liquid water actually flowed across the surface. The problem is, state-of-the-art climate models for early Mars tend to produce temperatures that rarely peak above freezing, and that suggests the planet's early wet periods may well have been fleeting events. Now, that's not the best scenario to sustain life on the surface over the long term. And so it's got some scientists thinking that maybe the Martian subsurface would be a better bet to look for Martian life. The question then becomes, what's the nature of that subsurface life, if it existed at all? And if so, where did it get its energy from? And that's where radiolysis comes in to help provide the energy for underground microbes. To reach their conclusions, the authors looked at data from the gamma-ray spectrometer aboard NASA's Mars Odyssey spacecraft. They mapped out the abundances of radioactive elements thorium and potassium in the Martian crust. And based on those abundances, they could then infer the abundance of a third radioactive element, uranium. It's the decay of these three elements which provides the radiation that then drives the radiolytic breakdown of water. And because these elements decay at constant rates, researchers could use the modern abundances to calculate what the abundances would have been like four billion years ago. And it was that which confirmed that the radiation flux back then would have been sufficient to drive radiolysis. Add to that is the geological evidence, which suggests there would have been plenty of groundwater bubbling about in the porous rocks of the ancient Martian crust. The researchers used measurements of the density of the Martian crust to estimate roughly how much port space would have been available for water to fill. And finally, the authors used geothermal and climate models in order to determine where the sweet spot for potential life on Mars would have been. You see, it can't be so cold that all the water would be frozen. But then again, it can also not be overcooked by heat from the planet's molten core. Combining all these analyses, the authors were able to conclude that Mars most likely had a global subsurface habitable zone several kilometres in thickness. 
In that zone, hydrogen production through radiolysis would have provided more than enough chemical energy to support microbial life based on what's known about similar communities here on Earth. And the zone would have persisted for hundreds of millions of years under a range of different climatic variations. And in fact, the authors found that the amount of subsurface hydrogen available for energy actually goes up under extremely cold climatic scenarios. That's because a thicker layer of ice above the habitable zone acts as a sort of lid to keep hydrogen from escaping the subsurface. These new findings will be useful for determining potential landing sites for future missions searching for signs of past life on the Red Planet. In particular, mission managers will be looking for regions of megabrechia blocks, that is, chunks of rock ejector excavated from underground during meteorite impacts. You see, much of this material would have originated from the habitable zone depth and is now just sitting there, often relatively unaltered, on the freeze-dried Martian surface. Two such sites, Northeast Sites Major and Midway, are being considered for NASA's Mars 2020 rover mission to the Red Planet. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. China says all systems are go for its historic mission to conduct the first ever landing of a rover on the far side of the moon. The Chang'e 4 mission will launch around December the 8th aboard a Long March 3B rocket from the Zhaichang Satellite Launch Center in southwestern China. Chang'e was the goddess of the moon in Chinese mythology. The landing is expected to take place on December the 30th or 31st, a day or two after sunrise on the lunar far side. The 1,200 kilogram Chang'e 4 will land in the Deep Von Kármán impact crater, located within the ancient 2,500 kilometre wide mineral rich South Pole Aiken Basin region. It's a region which appears to contain huge deposits of iron, thorium, titanium, and other exotic minerals. The region's also a potential stepping stone for future missions to Mars because of its frozen water reserves. Not only can that water be used for drinking, but it can also be split into hydrogen and oxygen, both for breathing and for use as rocket fuels. The basin could also provide scientists with new clues about the moon's formation and early history and evolution. But for China, the project's more about Beijing's ambitious plans to set up a lunar base and eventually mine helium-3 and other minerals from the lunar surface. And because it always faces away from the Earth, the lunar far side will also provide a perfect radio quiet region for deep space radio astronomy. Mind you, it's that same radio quiet which has provided one of the biggest problems for landing on the far side of the Moon. That is, the problem of communication. To resolve that issue, Beijing first launched the Kyugyo or Magpie Bridge communication satellite back in May. Magpie Bridge was flown to a special lunar orbit some 60,000 kilometres behind the lunar far side, a region known as the Moon's Lagrangian II position, a sort of gravitational neutral zone which would hold a spacecraft in position relative to the Moon simply through the Moon's own gravitational forces. And from there, the satellite's able to relay communications between mission managers on Earth and the Chang'e 4 lander and its rover on the lunar surface. The tiny 120 kilogram Chang'e 4 rover is equipped with a huge 5 meter antenna, but will otherwise be almost identical to its predecessor, the Chang'e 3 rover U2 or Jade Rabbit, which landed on the moon in December 2013. In fact, the Chang'e 4 rover was built as a backup for the Jade Rabbit. Chang'e 3 landed on the Mare Ibrium on the lunar near side, where it then launched its small six wheeled solar powered Jade Rabbit rover. Jade Rabbit was designed to spend three months exploring the region around its landing site, but sadly it broke down after just 110 metres. Nevertheless, it was able to continue operating as a stationary lunar science platform until 2016, using its stereo panoramic camera, ground-penetrating radar and alpha particle X-ray spectrometer. Like its predecessor, the Chang'e 4's lander will also be equipped with cameras, spectrometers and radars to study the surrounding lunar composition and geology. To find out more, Andrew Dunkley is speaking with astronomer Dr. Fred Watson. China's lunar exploration plans, they want to get to the the far side of the moon. That's right, for the first time. So all the lunar exploration that has been done so far, at least on the surface, either robotically or by humans walking around on the moon, it's all been done on the near side of the moon. And the reason for that is very simple. That's the best place to put a spacecraft if you want to communicate with Earth. Mm. We do know a lot about the far side because, of course, 
course, orbiting spacecraft are able to image the far side, and I mean up spacecraft that orbit the moon. And perhaps the most prominent at the moment is NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which has done a fantastic job of imaging the moon's surface, including all the Apollo landing sites. So we've seen what's left there, the stuff you were talking about being left behind. But the idea of going to the far side of the moon is an audacious one, which has been proposed by the Chinese as part of their lengthy sequence of lunar exploration. The last spacecraft that hit the headlines was their Chang'e 3 lander, which took with it a little rover called Yutu, or Jade Rabbit, that landed in December 2013. And the rover actually operated for quite a long time. It had, um, if I remember rightly, it had an ultraviolet telescope on board, but it didn't rove. Something with the mechanism broke down very quickly, so it wound up staying in the same spot. Yeah, but it, the, the, the mission, Chang'e 3, was partially, and in fact probably mostly successful, apart from the rover itself. However, the program that the Chinese have, which culminates, of course, in human flights to the moon, probably in the maybe in the late 2020s, but their program now extends to Chang'e 4, and that mission is scheduled to launch in December. It's going to the far side of the moon. So the first problem is, how do you communicate with a spacecraft on the far side of the moon? The moon is entirely opaque to radio waves, so you're not going to beam anything through it. A massive uh, antenna or maybe a satellite. Yes, you've got it right. It's a satellite, and it's a clever satellite too, and it's already there which is pretty amazing because they launched this spacecraft, which is called, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing this, Kikyo. I think it translates as Magpie Bridge, which I like very much. Oh, that's nice. The Magpie Bridge is a communication satellite launched back in May, as I said. And apparently, it is, it is from a Chinese folktale, and it comes about because of separated lovers in the Milky Way and the magpies of the world in the folktale, form a bridge to reunite them. How about that? That's lovely, yes. It's very poetic, yeah, it's very nice. What is really interesting about the Magpie Bridge communication satellite is where it's placed, because it is in orbit, but not in orbit about the moon. It's in orbit around an imaginary point called the second Lagrange point. Yes. What's that? Well, it's a point, it's about 60,000 kilometers behind the, beyond the far side of the moon. In other words, imagine the Earth, the moon, and this point in a straight line. 60,000 kilometers beyond the moon is this stable point. And it, it, it's where the, the gravity of the Earth, the gravity of the moon, and the effect of the centrifugal rotation of the moon around the Earth, where they all balance out and you get a sort of neutral point in gravity. There is one on this side of the moon as well, what's called the L1 point, the first Lagrange point. And there are actually four others as well. But the first one is the easiest one to understand because it's where the gravity of the Earth and the gravity of the moon exactly balance out. And we, we can all get that. It's a little bit less intuitive when you go to the other side of the moon and you find another one of these balance points. That's the L2 point. And this is the point in which, around which Magpie Bridge is in orbit. So you can imagine spacecraft orbiting around, it, effectively it's a, a thing called a gravitational well. It's where gravity is low. And that mimics basically a gravitating body so that the Magpie Bridge spacecraft can orbit around it. It orbits around it in such a way that we can see it from Earth beyond the moon. And so that means that the problem is solved. You beam your radio signals from Earth to Magpie Bridge and it beams them back to the far side of the moon. It's extraordinary stuff. Just wrapping this up, the perhaps the most interesting thing about this mission is that we expect we might find the some of the perhaps more exotic minerals that we believe exist on the moon. There is a, a region on the moon's far side. It's probably the biggest impact basin on the moon, a very ancient one, because it's, it itself is covered in craters. It's not like the impact basins on the near side, which are full of what used to be molten basalt. This one's a big dent in the moon's surface near its south pole. It's called the Aitken South Pole Basin, and that is probably where the rover will, will land, the new Chinese spacecraft, and maybe, just maybe, we'll find all kinds of interesting stuff there, because this is an area that very early on in the moon's history had a major clout from something pretty big. Mm. So, and, and, uh, and, and we haven't been there in, in person, and there's this uh, only sort of 
uh, orbiting observations that that we can really go on. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a it's a, it's a bit more of a mystery than, than the the other side, uh, which is flatter too, I believe. So it is an interesting place to go. Just the challenge of putting a spacecraft on the far side of the moon. That's Dr. Fred Watson, an astronomer with the Department of Science, speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program, Space Nuts. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Astronomers think they've discovered a new type of stellar collision, a nova generated when a white dwarf collides with a brown dwarf. White dwarfs are the stellar corpses of dead sun-like stars, while brown dwarfs fill the gap between the largest planets and the smaller stars, objects which have failed to accumulate enough mass to sustain the core nuclear fusion process which makes stars shine. A report in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society claims scientists have found evidence that a white dwarf and brown dwarf collided in the short-lived blaze of glory which was witnessed on Earth back in July 1670 as Nova sub Capite Cygni, a new star below the head of the swan, which is now known as CK Volpeculae, located about 2,280 light-years away and one of the oldest reliably documented novas or new stars. Where once there was dark sky, a bright pinprick of light suddenly appeared, faded, reappeared, and then disappeared entirely from view. Modern astronomers studying the remains of this cosmic event initially thought it heralded the merging of two main sequence stars, that is, stars on the same evolutionary path as our Sun. However, new observations with ALMA, the European Southern Observatory's Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array Telescope in Chile, are pointing to a far more intriguing explanation. By studying the debris from this explosion, which takes the form of dual rings of dust and gas resembling an hourglass with a compact central object, astronomers have concluded that what most likely happened was that a brown dwarf collided or merged with a white dwarf. One of the study's authors, Summer Starfield, I kid you not, from Arizona State University, says it now seems that what was actually observed centuries ago was not what we would today describe as a classic nova. Instead, it was the merger of two stellar objects, a white dwarf and brown dwarf. When these two objects collided, they spilled out a cocktail of molecules and unusual isotopes, which are providing us with new insights into the nature of this object. The authors say the white dwarf would have been about 10 times more massive than the brown dwarf, although it would have physically been far smaller and denser in diameter. As the brown dwarf spiralled inwards, intense tidal forces exerted by the white dwarf would have ripped it apart. This is the first time such an event has been conclusively identified. Since most star systems in the Milky Way are binary, stellar collisions are not all that rare. But the new ALMA observations are revealing new details about the 1670 event. By studying the light from two more distant stars as it shone through the dusty remains of the merger, astronomers were able to spectroscopically detect the telltale signature of the element lithium, which is easily destroyed in the interior of a main sequence star which goes on to become a white dwarf, but not inside a brown dwarf. The presence of lithium, together with unusual isotopic ratios of the elements carbon, nitrogen and oxygen, all point to material from a brown dwarf being dumped onto the surface of a white dwarf. The thermonuclear burning and an eruption of this material resulted in the hourglass we see today. Intriguingly, the hourglass is also rich in organic molecules such as formaldehyde and formamide, which is derived from formic acid. These molecules would not have survived in an environment undergoing nuclear fusion, and so must have been produced in the debris from the explosion, lending even further support to the hypothesis that a brown dwarf met its demise in a star-on-star collision with a white dwarf. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study of over 400,000 people aged 18 to 85, reported in the journal Alcoholism, Clinical and Experimental Research, has found that consuming one to two drinks four or more times per week, an amount deemed healthy by current guidelines, actually increases the risk of premature death by 20%, compared with drinking three times a week or less. And the increased risk in death was consistent across all age groups. Although previous studies have linked light drinking to improvements in cardiovascular health, this new study shows that those potential gains are far outweighed by other risk factors, such as increased rates of cancer and, as a result, mortality. 
The new study comes on the hills of research published in The Lancet, which reviewed data from more than 700 studies around the world, concluding that the safest level of drinking is none. But that study looked at all types of drinking, from light alcohol through to binge drinking. This new study focused on light drinkers, those who consumed only one or two drinks per day. A new study has found that humans can recognise an average of 5,000 different faces. The findings, reported in the Journal of the Royal Society Proceedings B, are based on how many faces participants could recall from their personal lives, including people they went to school with, friends, colleagues and family. They also looked at how many famous faces people recognised, such as actors, politicians and other public figures. The participants found it easy to come up with lots of faces at first, but harder to think of new ones by the end of an hour. And that change of pace allowed researchers to estimate when they could run out of faces completely. Paleontologists have discovered the fossilised remains of the first and oldest preserved soft tissue of a terrestrial gastropod, in other words a snail. The 99 million year old snail was discovered preserved in amber. The animal has now been described in the journal Cretaceous Research. The snail, which was found in Myanmar, lived in a hot tropical environment, not unlike Myanmar today. Well, girls, if you think men are pretty useless now, there's new research showing that healthy mice, bred using only female genes, have gone on to produce normal pups of their own, no men required. The work by the Chinese Academy of Sciences used altered stem cells from a female mouse, which were then injected into the eggs of another female mouse. Of the 210 embryos produced, 29 survived. Mice pups from two males were also born using a similar but more complex approach, but they only survived a couple of days. The researchers were examining what makes it so challenging for mammals of the same sex to reproduce, finding that at least some of these barriers can be overcome using stem cells and targeted gene editing. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.